The heart of Christianity is not a new approach to morality. It's not a self-help plan for new beginnings. It is not peering out into the mystery of the universe in order to find secrets that are hidden there. The heart of Christianity is the simple fact that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. He spent three days in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And on the third day, God raised him back to life so that we might experience salvation from sin and death. That is the good news. And if you hear nothing else that we share here this morning, that is the message. In fact, I have nothing better to share than that because there is nothing that we can do to improve upon that. That is the gospel in its clearest and simplest form. And this morning on the basis of that, I wanna take you back to the first Easter, to the miracle of the resurrection. And I wanna spend a few minutes here today just doing something that we've never done before on an Easter Sunday. I wanna kick off a series. More often than not, we are either concluding a series or this is a standalone topic but this week, this year, we're kicking off a series. The brand new series is going to be called Miracle Academy. And I wanna to talk to you this morning about the dawn of the resurrection, and more importantly, the dawn of the miraculous. Luke chapter 24 and verse one. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Right here on the morning of the greatest miracle in history, the disciples are struggling to believe that the resurrection is true. I want to begin with two simple questions here this morning. First, do you believe in miracles? We've talked a lot about miracles here this morning. Pastor Karna led us in prayer for miracles, and we celebrated the reports of miracles. And throughout the entire worship service, you may have noticed that word, without our planning, without our preparation, we're not smart enough or well-organized enough to do that. But I've heard the word miracle or some reference to miracle come up consistently since we entered the room today. Do you believe in miracles? I'm not asking about a beautiful sunset or whether you believe that the birth of a child is a miracle or even the wonder at first, of love at first sight. As remarkable as those things are, I'm talking about something that couldn't happen apart from divine intervention. Do you believe in the supernatural? Do you believe that God performs miracles? In his book, entitled Miracle, C.S. Lewis defines a miracle as an interference with nature by a supernatural power. I love that idea of supernatural interference because honestly, there are a lot of things in our world that are in need of being interfered with, right? I mean, things like sickness and disease, hopelessness and despair, 
poverty and lack and oppression and injustice. There are a lot of things that need interfered with. I know a few people who need to be interfered with as well, but that's a completely different subject. We need supernatural interference because despite our best efforts, there are some things that we just can't manage into a better state. And that's not for lack of trying. We've had our shot at building a better world without God, and history has proven that we just can't do it. So God performs miracles to set the world right again, to return things to their original design, back to their initial condition, back to the way they were before sin and death. So with that in mind, let me ask the question again, do you believe in miracles? But let me phrase it this way, do you believe that God has enough power and that he cares enough about you personally to intervene in your personal circumstances to work out his promises to turn things to the good and to perform a miracle where you need one i hope so i really hope so because i just can't imagine living life without believing in miracles Do you believe in miracles? That brings me then to the second question. If you believe in miracles, are you expecting a miracle? Are you believing for a miracle? I know a lot of people who can answer the first question with a lot more confidence than they can answer the second one. They believe that miracles exist in history. They they believe that God even intervenes in developing countries where that people don't have the medical resource and the financial resource that we have here in the Western world and particularly in America. They believe God does those sorts of things on the mission field as it's often been called. But when it comes to God moving right here in our community, in our culture, in our society, they just don't believe God can do miracles here. Clearly, if you don't believe that miracles are possible, you won't expect them to happen in your life. And even for those of us who do believe in miracles, we go through seasons when we don't see the goodness of God. We see the goodness of God in the circumstances of others. We see divine intervention and interference there, and we see the wonder of what God is doing for friends and family members and in the reports that we share on Sunday morning, but we wonder, what, what, where are you in my circumstance, God? Where are you in my situation? How come you seem to favor other people? How come you seem to do miracles for their family, in their health, in their struggles, in their conditions? How is it that you work for them, but you don't do it for me? And we find ourselves struggling oftentimes to believe because we haven't seen the goodness of God in our own lives. And when we fail to see those things, we oftentimes slide into a state of disillusionment, despair, maybe even cynicism, which only makes it even more difficult. And and I wanna say that I think we've all been there at some point or another. We've all been there, we've all faced disappointment in life and, and we've struggled to continue believing in God despite the conditions that we find ourselves in. I, I wanna say that's no way to live. God has a better way for you and the resurrection points to the fact that you can believe in God, you can trust his promise and you can rely on the fact that if he raised his son from the dead, he will do in your life exactly what he has promised to do. He is a faithful and loving and compassionate God. But it's not easy. And this is what the disciples were struggling with on the morning of the resurrection. At the dawn of the miraculous age being inaugurated, they struggled to believe that it had actually happened. When people stop believing for miracles, they then descend into disappointment like the disciples. They then fall into hopelessness and cynicism and even despair. And it even ends up hindering, oftentimes, what God is planning to do in their life. That's why believing matters. Because believing is the act of cooperating with the promises of God so that we might partner with God to see him bring his purposes to pass in our lives. 
It's easy to just say, well, God, if you're God and if you do miracles, then show up and prove it to me. And, and he does that. He certainly did that on the morning of the resurrection. Despite their unbelief, he proved himself faithful. But the better way to live is to live in partnership with God, in cooperation with God, in surrender to God, saying to God, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I am here ready and expectant for you to do what only you can do. What if you knew that you were just a week away from the answer to your prayers? What if you knew that you were just a month away from the answer to your prayers? What if you knew you were just nine months away, yeah, from the answer to your prayers? Would you find it easier to believe? Of course, if we all had a timeline on it, if we all had the reassurance that it was gonna happen on a certain day, we would find it easier to believe. But God calls us to live in the tension of trusting him and believing him and expecting his best in our lives, even when we don't know the moment when he is going to do what he has planned to do. I'm encouraging you here this morning to live as if God has raised Jesus from the dead, knowing that if he has, nothing is impossible for him. If he can raise his son from the dead. He can raise you to a new life. He can raise you to a life that is free, a life that is blessed, a life that is filled with righteousness and peace and joy. He can raise you from your dead circumstances to a living hope, and the resurrection is the evidence of that. I want to encourage you to expect God to intervene this year. Back to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was called Jack by his friends, and as many of you will know, he was a, a luminary uh, British scholar. He taught at Oxford in his uh, younger years and had a presence there shaping uh, the institution and so much of what we believe about our faith, what we understand to be true according to the scriptures, has been shaped by C.S. Lewis. Well, there was a point in time when C.S. Lewis, or Jack as he was called, didn't believe. In fact, he was an avowed atheist. He had been through some profound disappointments like the disciples, maybe like you. And as a result, he came to believe that he should build his life on the basis of what he called unyielding despair. What a foundation. Intentionally, methodically, philosophically, he built his life on the foundation of this unrelenting, unyielding despair. And for decades, Jack denied the existence of God until he read a book that opened his mind. It didn't convince him, but it got him thinking in the right direction. And from this point on, he felt as if God was pursuing him. God was reaching out to him. The whispers of heaven were resonating throughout his soul. And the louder that the whispers of God became, the more that Lewis put his head down and tried to ignore them. He later wrote and said, any time his mind lifted from his work, it drifted back to the existence of God. And so finally he comes to a point in time when he gets down on his knees and surrenders, not to Jesus per se, but to the idea of God. And at that moment in time, he became what he later said was the most reluctant convert in history. He came, he was drug into the kingdom of God. Maybe that's some of you here this morning, I get it. When I was a kid, I had a drug problem too. My parents drugged me to church on Sunday and I didn't wanna be there. And maybe somebody's drug you here this morning and, and, and you're a, a reluctant convert like C.S. Lewis. You're, you're kicking the tires of faith and accepting the idea that, that maybe God exists, but you're not convinced about Jesus. From that point on, Lewis got up off of his knees and began to develop this sort of abstract general relationship with the God of heaven. And, and then for some time, he, he lived in that state. In fact, it was a couple of years later that he began a personal relationship with Jesus. And ironically, it was based on a discussion about mythology. One night on September the 19th, 1931, Jack went for a late night walk with his dear friend and fellow Oxford professor, J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien was just enthralled with the myths 
the Norse myths and the Celtic myths, and he was writing his own mythology. We, we know it. It eventually came to be called Lord of the Rings based upon his mythology of Middle Earth. And they were good friends walking one night in a conversation. As they walked, Tolkien challenged Jack to consider the possibility that once, just once, that heaven had broken into earth, that God had entered into time, that a miracle had actually taken place just one single time in history with the coming of Jesus. You see, Tolkien believed the idea that the myths are the signs that we all know deep within ourselves that there's a world out there that we can't see. In fact, Tolkien proposed the popular motif, the common motif you may have seen in uh, movies or in mythologies or even in Marvel comics, the mythology of a god being killed and being raised to life again. Tolkien believed that that was just the evidence of human beings bearing witness to the reality of what God had planned in Jesus because we have eternity within our hearts and the residue of eternity within us reminds us of what God has planned for us on some deep and subconscious level. And so he has this conversation and Lewis is confronted with the idea that maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. He began to wrestle with the implications. What if all the myths in history point to something that is not only true, but is truer than everything we know in the world? What if the material world is just the shadow lands? And what if we were meant for another place that is more real and true? And what if our longing for that place is what has led humanity through the ages to create the myths and the fairy tales? And what if God came into our world just one time in Jesus to say to us, I love you and I want to take your hand and I want to lead you back into the place that I have prepared for you, the place I have dreamt for you from the foundations of time. What if that's true? After wrestling with it, C.S. Lewis surrendered to faith. And later he came to believe that if you just believe in one miracle, an entire world of miracles will open up to you. See, miracles are the clues that the other world is not in our imaginations, but that it's actually out there, wherever out there is. And the resurrection is the sign that there is a world beyond the one that we can weigh and measure and evaluate. The one that is hard and cold and rational and analytical. The one that we're so comfortable in. There is another world that we may not be nearly as comfortable with. And that is the eternal world that we will exist in in some form or another for all of eternity. God invites us into that world on the basis of what Jesus has done for us. What do miracles point to? Real quickly this morning, number one, miracles point to the reality of God's existence. In the Old Testament, miracles attested to the fact that God existed. In the New Testament, miracles were performed by Jesus, some of which were seen by thousands of people in order to prove that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. In John chapter 14 and verse 11, Jesus says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe me on the evidence of the works themselves. If you can't believe my teaching, if you can't believe my divinity, if you can't believe my, my parables, if you can't believe what I tell you about the law and the prophets from a place of authority, then look at the miracles as the evidence that I am not like every other prophet. I am in fact the Son of God. I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. And the evidence of miracles were everywhere. God brought his son into the world through a miracle at the incarnation. God brought him back into the world through a miracle at the resurrection. And between those two bookends, the life of Jesus was filled with miracles. He healed the sick. He delivered the oppressed. He turned water into wine. He walked on the water. He calmed the wind and the waves. He healed the blind. 
He opened deaf ears. He raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. All through the Gospels, we see somewhere in the neighborhood of almost 40 miracles that Jesus performs. And all of those miracles are signs pointing us back to the fact that he is the Savior of the world, sent to die for us and raised to life for us so we might put our trust in him. Second, miracles point to the goodness of God, the goodness of God. Besides the obvious value of miracles, such as alleviating pain when it comes to healing or, or improving the quality of someone's life as it relates to being set free from some addiction or being free from oppression or even God blessing someone materially, miracles attest to the fact that God is good and that he does good. Psalm 119 and verse 68, miracles show us the nature of a kind, compassionate, loving, and gracious heavenly Father who wants to give good things to us. Here's what the Bible says in Acts 10, 37. You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Miracles attest to the goodness of God. Now, when you don't know the nature of God, you'll just randomly look at things in life and say it was just serendipitous. It was fate. It was karma. It was luck. It just happened for me and I, I can't rationalize it. But when you begin to know the nature of God and that every good and precious gift comes from above, then you begin to look back over your life and see the fingerprints of God all over your life, even when you didn't know God was working in your story. If I could dust your life for evidence today, I'll tell you, we would find the fingerprints of God in keeping you alive, in keeping you in the state that you're in, in bringing you here today, in allowing you to enjoy what you already enjoy in life. The fingerprints of God are all over your life because he's a good God and he has good things in store for you. Number three, miracles point to the glory of God. The glory of God. God doesn't want us to miss this critical idea. So he tells us immediately after Jesus performs the first miracle, God wants us to make the connection between the miracle and his goodness, grace, and glory. John chapter 2 and verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and the disciples believed in him. When God performs miracles, his beauty, his wonder, his magnificence, his majesty are on display because miracles show us his glory. And that word glory is an Old Testament word that means kabod. It means weight. Just think about it. In a world that weights things in the direction of cynicism and criticism, and hopelessness, and despair. Jesus does miracles to weight things in another direction so that we would know the character and nature of a loving God. Miracles reveal the glory of God in the world. And then finally, fourth, miracles point to salvation in Jesus. Miracles show us that there is exceedingly and abundantly more than what we've asked or even thought of. And if we trust God, God will bring us into it and bring them into our life. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Watch this. Watch this, friends. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. God attested to salvation by signs and wonders and miracles. Miracles point us to his salvation. And I wanna to say today that I'm gonna pray for miracles to happen in this room before I'm through here today. Yeah, can we believe for God to do something special in the lives of people? Can we believe in Las Vegas for God to do something live there, even though I'm standing here in Phoenix preaching to our church in the space, leaning in and believing God? I, I think we can. But before I get to that, I want to say something important. 
As much as I'm encouraging you to live a life anticipating the miraculous that comes from God, I also want you to know that you have been given the most important miracle. The greatest miracle is salvation. And all the other miracles point us to salvation. They point us back to the most important miracle. The most important miracle is the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus taught us that. In fact, he did a miracle to make the point. It's in Matthew chapter 9. And there's a paralyzed man that Jesus heals just to prove that he has the power to forgive sins. Yeah, verse 9. He said, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. And the Pharisees were angry, not because the man was healed, but because Jesus said, I can forgive sins. He performs the miracle to prove that if he can do that, he also can forgive sins. I look around this room today and I see a lot of living, breathing, walking, talking, praising God miracles because you've been forgiven of your sins. I stepped up here when Pastor Jason was doing the fun bit with the Easter Bunny earlier, and I stood back here at the back of the worship team just to look out across the room, and as I did, my heart just leapt for joy because of what I see in the room today, because of who I see in the room today, because of what I have seen God do in this room today. There are people in this room today who were strung out on drugs, some even living on the streets, but for the goodness of God. I looked out and saw people today serving on our team who were in prison, who had committed crimes and paid a sentence for them, but had found Jesus while they were in jail and have now come out and are living a life that is productive, a life that is meaningful, a life that contributes because of a miracle. I see people who've been healed of physical illnesses in the room. I see people who've come through unimaginable heartbreak. You've lost loved ones, and without God in your life, you might have taken your own life. But because of his grace, you're a living, breathing, walking, talking miracle. He's pulled some of you out of emotional black holes that you couldn't pull yourself out of, but he wouldn't let you slide into despair. He came after you in that despair, and he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be there for you because I'm a kind and loving God who cares for you. I see people in the room who are also living their dreams people who are at the top of their game, people who had accomplished everything their hearts set out to, but they were empty inside. I see people in this room of wealth and influence and favor who were missing the most important thing in their life, and that is God. And now, in finding God, they're living with freedom and with peace and with joy, living flourishing lives that are meaningful, rich in what matters most. And then can I tell you, I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but can I tell you about somebody else I saw this morning? And I didn't anticipate this when I was preparing the sermon this week. I knew I would see certain faces, but I looked out across this room and it was as if I heard the Spirit whisper to me, look also at the people in the room who have followed Jesus since they were children. And the miracle in their life is that they were never strung out on drugs. They were never in prison. They were never hopeless, hopeless and in despair. They never lived in conditions beyond knowing Jesus. And that's a miracle. Young people, you don't have, the, have to have the other kind of testimony. You can have the testimony that God has kept me and his saved and sustaining grace is as wonderful and beautiful as the grace that reaches the worst sinner. See, the greatest miracle is not, as the band comes back, it's not that God raised Jesus to life. The greatest miracle is that God has raised us to life. I want you to think about that for a moment. As remarkable as it is that God raised Jesus from the dead, it makes sense that he would raise him from the dead. He was sinless. We are sinful. He was perfect. We are imperfect. He kept God's law in every way. 
Some of us broke God's law in every way. It makes perfect sense that God would raise his faithful son who was fully God and fully man back to life. But it is completely illogical that God would love me and you and raise us back to life from the dead when we were undeserving of his goodness and his grace. But I want you to know that the greatest miracle in history is not that he raised Jesus, but that he has forgiven you, he has saved you, he has set you free, he has given you a hope. He has given you a future. And one day, he has promised to raise you at the resurrection from the dead so you will spend all of eternity with him in his loving and tender care. I want to bring it full circle. On resurrection morning, although the disciples had walked with Jesus for three years, they struggled to believe this miracle. Listen to me, friends. Just because you've seen one miracle doesn't make it easy to believe the others. I think it may make it easier, but it doesn't make it easy to believe. But we don't need an easy believism. We need a determined believism. We need an intentional believism that is placed in the authority of God's word. We need to trust God based on what we've seen. And Jesus knows this. So not only does he come out of the tomb but he starts appearing to them individually. And it takes a while. We're gonna talk about this over the next couple of weeks as along with our team here, we preach and share on the miracles that we see between the resurrection and Pentecost, this little space of time and what happens tomorrow in the gospel story. Jesus starts showing up. And as he starts showing up to them, they start to believe a little more, a little more. Maybe that's you. Maybe. Each Easter when you show up, you're getting a little more comfortable with the idea of God. You're getting a little more comfortable with the supernatural reality of the resurrection. You're getting a little more comfortable with the fact that God is genuinely moving in the lives of the people around you and their lives are the proof of what he has done and has promised to do for you. Maybe you're getting a little comfortable with this. And for them, it took a little bit of time. But as he appears, they go from unbelieving to doubtful to hesitant, to cautious, to curious, to accepting, and finally to believing. I don't know where you are on that journey today. Unbelieving, doubtful, hesitant, cautious, curious, accepting, or believing. It doesn't have to take you a month or a year to get there. You can go from one to the other in a single moment of time in a single service. Maybe you came in here this morning and you were unbelieving, but maybe by now you sense God's presence in this room and you're saying, I've, I've, I've made that journey. It doesn't mean I don't have any questions. It doesn't mean I don't have any doubts. It doesn't mean that my mind still can, can easily grasp the resurrection, but it means that my heart has gone from unbelieving to believing in a single moment of time. Jesus appears to them to show them that he is alive. And over time, they begin to realize something. It's not the fact that Jesus is alive. It's the fact that he is risen. I mean, if Jesus is alive, there could be a thousand reasons for that. But if he's risen, if he's truly dead, truly buried, truly raised to life on the third day, it means he is the son of God. It means he is the Messiah of Israel. It means he is the savior of the whole world. It means he is the risen king. And it also means that Easter is the dawn of the miraculous for all who put their trust in him. Jesus told us this in my final verse, John 11 and verse 24. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? 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 I don't care where you put the emphasis. The question hangs out there for all of us. And the response that he's looking for is simply, Lord, I believe. Believing is a choice. It is an action of 
trust. It is the process and way of surrender. Would you bow your head here this morning? It is such an honor to have you with us, and we're going to finish here in just a couple of minutes, but this is the most important part. I want to pray for the greatest miracle to take place in this room, and then I'm going to pray for other miracles to take place. The greatest miracle is forgiveness of sins. And if you're here today and or in Las Vegas, or even on our online community, and you would say, Pastor Terry, I, I want that miracle. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be set free from guilt and shame. I, I want God to move into my life and give me his salvation. I want to leave Easter service different this year. I want to leave with a new beginning. If that's you, I want to pray for you. And with every head bowed, just so you have a moment of privacy, if you would say, Please include me in this prayer. Terry, would you just slip your hand up wherever you are so I can see you? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see your hand. I see, yes, I see you waving. See you there. See you there. See you. All the way on the back row, here in the middle, hands going up. I see all oh, in this section, all the way in the back. I see you. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for salvation. I see you. I see an entire family, it looks like, over here or a group together. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. The kindness of a Savior, the compassion of a God who is going to do something miraculous now. You're going to pass from death to life. Would you pray this prayer with me? It's a prayer of saying, I believe. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I surrender my life to you. I choose to believe. I believe Jesus is your son. He was sent to die for me and raised to life for me. So I put my trust in him. And from this day forward, I will live surrendered to you. I will allow you to work in me. I will allow you to lead me. I will partner with you, God, so that every miracle you promised will come to pass in my life. I give you my sins and I accept your salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. We are celebrating this moment because heaven is celebrating this moment as well.